Today on the Grave Talks, Dark Magic. For several years, Yusef Tilly worked with a warlock in South Africa who used white magic to cure a variety of common and supernatural problems. Many incidents involved various types of jinns and other interdimensional creatures. Yusef documented these cases while helping with the preparations and ceremonies. How dark and deep does a demon world reach? What kind of extreme powers do these demonic forces hold over the living when invited in? And is there ever a way to reverse a deal that is made with the demonic? How how did you find yourself in this situation? How did you find yourself following uh, this individual and, and, and witnessing some of these, these things? Uh, well, it's partly by chance, actually. Um, through a friend of a friend, I had heard about someone who was having some uh, trouble, I suppose, where uh, the doctors couldn't quite explain what was going on. And... Uh, I suppose uh, part of the allure of it was that the society in which this person, individual, came from, um, they're quite traditional, so uh, they have a sense of reliance on traditional methodologies rather than uh, scientific or medical ones. And I thought, actually, when I first heard about it, that this is ridiculous. I mean, if people are having trouble, they should actually go and see a doctor or a psychologist or whatever is needed. Sure. Or at least explore those possibilities yeah which, so, uh, which of course we all we all agree upon that should be usually step number one uh yeah absolutely i mean it's the reasonable step to take at least yeah so continue so, on with what happened then uh you know with with your findings uh well what had happened initially was that um uh i had met uh through some mutual friends a uh, this person, you could say, who is a warlock, uh, what he really is, is someone who assists people with, uh, you could say, spiritual matters. Uh, he's a kind of white magician, and uh, he happens, uh, I mean, over a period of time, we befriended, our, uh, we befriended each other. So I got to hear a little bit more about it, and um, when this particular case of this woman who was having a problem, when that came up, I asked to actually come along. So uh, he said, look, they will need some help here, but uh, I would need to operate under his instructions. So there and then we, uh, we kind of stuck a deal, I suppose. The agreement was that uh, uh, I, of course, would be going uh, to help along with him, and I want, and in exchange, he'd allowed me to be exposed to how the magic worked and uh, how the process worked so that I could have a look and see if it interested me or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, this very first case, what had happened was uh, I wrote about it extensively in a story on my website called Bad Love. Uh, the, the story is also available on Amazon. So, I mean, it's been widely available. Uh, people have been reading it and have got many comments on it. Um, but yes, so we arrived at this, uh, at this house, uh, which was a typical family environment. A lot of people quite... Uh, um, uh, quite nervous about what was going to go on that night, but uh, four of us arrived, uh, which was uh, the, the white magician as well as myself and two others, and we were joined by uh, men in the family who then um, led us to a room in which we began working the white magic on on this particular woman. Okay, so, now uh, stop there for a second because I want to understand and, and paint the picture a little bit more for the audience. Um, tell me what part of the world this is going on in, and and when your 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 friend here got the call for help, what how were they reaching out? What were they saying? Were they saying that they exhausted uh, attempts at at medical intervention? And now, what what can you do for us? Fill us in a little bit more about that. Well, on that particular case, I didn't actually know the backstory, so it, I was completely new to the entire situation, and I was just going to have a look. Okay. So uh, I, I didn't really have many questions, but subsequently, in fact, the book that I've just uh, finished writing now is about one particular case uh, that I investigated with a, with a magician for close to two years, and there... Um, in that instance, there had been um, engagement with doctors, psychologists, okay. and so on, in order to try and resolve the issues and before the white 
Yeah. And let's go into that one next. Why don't you continue on with the first story and, and tell me as you're going into this, you know, just as as someone who wants to, to witness and report on what they're seeing, what are you thinking? What are you feeling as you go into this? I know you initially mentioned you're thinking this is kind of, uh, you know, ridiculous, but let's see what happens. What what occurred on that first uh, first experience you had? Uh, well, when once I was in there, I was initially uh, kind of perplexed, I suppose, because the way that um, uh, the actual therapy was conducted, uh, I thought, well, hang on a second, something doesn't quite make sense here. I mean, this woman doesn't look like she's ill in any particular way, but she certainly was behaving in in in, way, in stranger ways, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So at uh, one point in time, what happened was, uh, or at least part of the process is, uh, she was um, possessed by what is called a jinn. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of it. It's a kind of interdimensional creature that's made out of, uh, that's fashioned out of uh, like a smoke, uh, like smoke and fire, mm -hmm. and uh, and they and they uh, they they kind of like little demons. And basically, what they do is that they enter um, a person's body through their through through the back of their neck, the nape. And inside, once they're inside, they begin to uh, pull these things and make them do strange things and so on, according to a certain mandate. So the jinn was placed there by a particular witch, and the witch was commissioned to do so. Um, uh, they usually use a uh, certain, like, personal effects, like uh, nail cuttings or period blood or something, in order to weave a charm, and that charm is hidden away. So the white magician is really it's an investigative process, not un, not unlike uh, a CSI investigation that you see on television, where they need to find the magical charm first in order to undo the spell, and then they can get the gin out. So in order to do so, what had happened, and this really had, uh, uh, interested me quite dramatically, was that uh, the white magician used the spell in order to channel the witch into the woman. And the initial part of the investigation began with an uh, interrogation of the witch, who obviously her body was laying somewhere, I'm not too sure exactly where. Uh, that began to pique my interest. And later on, we, uh, he also called up the demon that was inside of her, at which time I got to speak to the demon. So initially, my, uh, uh, my interest really lied in the conversation I had with the demon. And that was, he said that he was uh, 800 years old, and I thought, hey, hang on a second. This was an opportunity to see humanity's history from someone who had lived it uh, for the past 800 years. And I was quite interested to see what a completely different perspective on the entire, uh, on our history was. And that's how it all began. So you, you begin this conversation with what is being told to you is a demon that is 800 years old. And, I mean, th there, there has to be an element to this going, OK, this is going to be interesting. This seems, you know, is this some sort of a mental illness that's plaguing this woman or is this something else? Is this, in fact, what it says it is? What do you ask of of this demon when you find out that that's what it is and that's how old it is on the spot boom you have to ask some questions to try and validate that this is what it says it is what do you say um well i started with the most basic things how do you go to toilet how do you have sex what does your world look like what do you eat where do you go how do you hang out i mean do you have an education or don't you have an education um, you know, all sorts of practical questions to mm -hmm. be able to draw a comparison between the life that we know and what is some creature living in some other dimension. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right. In order to validate this stuff, uh, to, to validate whether this indeed was happening to this woman or she was really just having a uh, maybe a serious case of mental projection, I suppose. Um, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do was um, look at the details around it and see uh, whether they had a sense of congruency about them. And, um, well, we ended up having, a, a, I suppose, a half an hour chat over it, uh, in which um, I didn't get many answers, but I did get a few, and that piqued my interest. What were some of the, the answers that stood out to you that really did pique your interest, that made you want to dig deeper into this and not just go, this person needs serious mental help? Uh, well, the one that really stuck me was the way that they communicate. 
So uh, one of the things that I noticed the woman was doing um, very early on was that she was grinding her teeth a lot. I later found out that this was um, a form of communication called whispering. Okay, so when the demon told me how they communicate, he said that they have a sort of telephone network in which they are able to whisper at, uh, at a certain very, very low frequency and the messages are carried from one place to another until it reaches the, uh, the intended recipient. Uh, so it goes you know, mouth to mouth all along the way. But the messages are made in such a way that everybody can't hear them. Um, the person on the other end then um, knows, you know, knows how to make sense of them. So it, it sounded to me like this is quite similar to what we have in terms of technology, but in a, well, I suppose in a very different way. Mm -hmm. but, um, but there was a certain sense of similarity about it. And from there, obviously, I started digging a little bit deeper. And, and as you dug deeper uh, and, and you went beyond this case, tell me how that went. Tell me what sort of background did you find? And you had mentioned earlier the next case that you had, had followed this individual on who was, uh, what do we refer, refer to this person as, a magician, as an exorcist? What exactly are they? Who is the individual that you're following or, uh, or what do they do? Um, I'd say it's something broader than an exorcist, so I'll simply say a magician. Okay. Uh, that would probably be an accurate term. Uh, and the we're, range not, of activity. we're not talking David Copperfield, American television special magician. We're talking, uh, what, what part of the world is this going on in? Um, all of this is happening in South Africa. Okay. So, okay. Uh, so I suppose I probably followed maybe around 10 to 12 cases for a period of about two to three years. Okay. And uh, this was all based in Johannesburg. Uh, obviously, the magician himself, he does travel. Yeah. So uh, he, he goes around uh, to different parts of the world in order to in order to resolve different kinds of cases when people call him. Okay. Um, and there are many like him. Now, take me into this next case where you did, in fact, find some more of the background and they had exhausted the medical care that was available to them. What were the doctors telling them? And, and at what point did the magician come into play uh, with that case? Um, when I got involved with the case, they had already seen several doctors. Uh -huh. um, and a lot of uh, the doctors refer them to psychologists. So uh, the woman who was possessed, uh, she was also a woman probably mid-age, around uh, late 30s. Um, her husband was about the same age and they had two children. Uh, the situation, and I suppose their life stage and so on, obviously had, uh, after many years of marriage, had probably brought them into typically what is uh, the type of situation for many people where there are many challenges, kids are growing up, financial challenges, home challenges and so on, as well as personal ones. And um, uh, the psychologist's view was that uh, she obviously needed to deal with some uh, issues that she had in her past, which um, have been suppressed for a long period of time. Um, so naturally they had gone through that process for quite some time but didn't find any results and that is how they ended up at uh, uh, at the magician's door okay um, now tell me tell me about some of the the symptoms that she was exhibiting because obviously there's a big difference between someone who is appearing to be possessed in in some way shape or form versus someone who is is suffering either from a mental breakdown or just some sort of a uh, you know a, a midlife crisis for lack of a better term just kind of folding or or crumbling a bit under the the terms of of what would be you know normal life stress at that point in in life oh absolutely yes uh, this is where it kind of gets a little bit strange um, one day, her husband comes home and finds her cleaning the entire house with uh, with with a popular um, um, anti-sanitary toilet liquid that uh, that we sell here in our supermarkets. Now it's 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 blue in color and basically stains everything because it's a very very strong detergent. But she had washed the wall, she had washed the the floor, she had washed the couches, the furniture, and everything with it, effectively ruining a lot of the houses. So in a way. She had, she had lost a sense of rationality, still thinking that this was 
the best way to clean it because it was a strong enough detergent to make sure that there were no germs available. Now these lapses in rationality uh, began to uh, be began to unfold in other areas of her life as well. So she wasn't um, she was behaving strangely at work, which I don't know a lot about because there wasn't much spoken about it. But she would sometimes get up in the middle of the night and 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 simply leave or go somewhere else. She would. Uh, her husband says that at some point in time uh, she would snap in such a way that her voice and her demeanor would change that she would become an entirely different person. When I had interviewed her uh, in some instances, she had begun to speak in a language that her husband's, that her husband um, was quite sure that she doesn't actually know. It's a local African dialect here mm -hmm. uh, that comes from uh, further south in South Africa, about probably about uh, six to seven hundred kilometers away from Johannesburg. But she was speaking the language quite fluently. Um, uh, and I later found out when the demon told me that he originated from that area. Very interesting, especially when someone is taking up, that, that's it's a big sign when it comes to exorcisms and things of that nature, when a, an individual is picking up information that they otherwise would not know, especially a language of some sort. That is usually a telltale sign. There's something else going on here beyond a, a mental breakdown of some sort. So these, these sort of symptoms, these sort of things are what the family is enduring, what she is enduring and they're trying to make sense of it. Doctors are somewhat befuddled, and they they reach out to to this individual who they think can give some sort of spiritual help or healing. What happens at that point? Uh, well, in the vast majority of the cases that I've seen, most people only really uh, uh, come to the magician after they've exhausted many of the other possibilities. And at that point, he begins this process, which kind of first backtracks and finds out the backstory um, in terms of what medical treatment they had undertook, um, what were the results of it, and then he makes an assessment based on it. Now, that is partly based on listening uh, to understand their backstory, but it also is part of a magic, it also has a magical component to it, which involves a spell which they conduct for 11 days. Um, in those 11 days, they drink a particular liquid that is. Um, that is made out of a spell that uses, um, well, certain um, natural ingredients, sometimes cloves, sometimes saffron, um, salt, and so on. And uh, it's infused into the water in a particular way. Um, and after that, it's um, they they drink the water for 11 days. This is meant to uh, this is meant as a diagnosis process, where he then finds out from within what is happening as opposed to the psychological story that they're saying. Tell me more about the case where you get in there and they begin, uh, or, or your, your friend here, uh, the magician, begins to uh, attempt to, to withdraw this, to, to correct this situation, to provide some relief. How, how did that go? Uh, well, initially, uh, once the diagnosis was made, it was, um, in her particular case, it was quite serious. So the way that uh, the demon was negotiated by a witch to enter into this woman's body was done on a certain premise that someone else had commissioned the witch, which means paid the witch in order to put a demon into her mm -hmm. so that it would, it would ruin her life. And there was a particular there was a particular reason for it, and uh, it was commissioned by someone uh, in in her own family. Uh, the reasons were mostly because of jealousy, but also complicated with other things. Uh, to bring initial relief to her, though, um, and actually this was an important tactic for the for this particular exorcism case because. Um, because the severity of the of the possession was was quite heavy, um, the magician needed to buy some time in order to figure out, or at least to see the lay of the land of the case. So what he did was provided relief also in the form of uh, little potions that he used to give her to drink on a on a daily basis, and that would allow her to remain clear and uh, with a sense of rationality for at least a few months while we while he was begin 
while he was extracting the relevant information he needed to be able to resolve the case. So they they have this the the liquid they have what what they're they're essentially it's kind of like medication to a certain extent. How are they going about trying to resolve the case, and how was this case resolved? Uh, well, it, firstly, it took quite a long time. Uh, the basic process of resolving cases like these, and uh, not all exorcism cases are like these, when a witch uh, casts a particular spell on someone. Then, uh, like I mentioned before, they what they do is that they create a a charm, uh, usually made out of personal effects and so on. Sometimes it's fingernails, sometimes it's bearded blood, sure. sometimes it's a piece of hair and so on. Uh, but they use it together, and they um, uh, witches then use it as part of a spell in which they tie the person's you could say life energy, I suppose, uh, to this charm. And this charm uh, then becomes an anchor through which they can uh, push and pull a person that they wish to control. So the first step in the process is to diagnose exactly how or what kind of spell has actually been cast on a particular person, even though uh, they may be possessed, because sometimes possession can occur just randomly. But um, in this particular case, uh, a charm, uh, the first part of the investigation revealed that the charm was present. And once that charm was present, and uh, once that knowledge was known, the uh, magician's duty then was to be able to f- locate that particular charm. Because once he can locate it, he can undo the uh, the, the binding uh, uh, the, the binding that the witch has created with the woman has with the woman's life energy. Uh, once he undoes that, then he's more freer to deal with the devil as well as the witch. Uh, which is the third step of the process. Mm -hmm. And after that, he then, uh, the last step of the process is to protect her from any further harm so the same thing doesn't happen again. And by that time, she's usually recovered quite dramatically and uh, she then has to do, I suppose, uh, the rehabilitation in terms of her her own self, you know, psychologically recovering from it. Is this something that is common in in that part of the world? Obviously, just the the concept of what we're talking about to our our audience in in America or or this type of society, um, this this sort of thing is, is you know not necessarily super common. It, it, typically, after there's um, a medical diagnosis or or whatnot, that's where it ends. It it doesn't go much further into. Um, a magician or exorcism. In, in some cases, it does, uh, or whatever term you want to call it, um, it, it, it kind of stops. Um, but in, in this part of the world, is this a common thing where there are essentially vendettas where you have what it sounds like here? You had mentioned it was a family member that put a, a curse, a hex, whatever you want to call it, onto this other woman. Is this a common form of... Um, of of uh, getting back at someone <laughs> to 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 do this sort of thing and and to essentially curse another individual uh well it's certainly not a common thing i okay. think the culture in south africa is very much like the culture in america sure uh, I, uh so in many ways it's not an entirely common thing but i think uh the big difference in the culture is that um in the western world um, there is a much more uh, predominant focus on science, which is a more an external, uh, externally focused way of dealing with problems. Sure. So your so, the, so your magicians in the in our culture in the West or in the Western culture is are your scientists, doctors, and your therapists, and so on. Okay. In the East, however, where uh, where this sort of uh, where this sort of thing is more common especially in places like the Far East, Thailand, Indonesia, and so on. Uh, there, the focus is actually quite internal. All okay. right, so there is a, uh, yeah, there is quite a difference in the culture in the way that people believe that it's not that externally anymore. They find solutions more internally. And in the internal world, uh, it's not always as clear as it is in the external world. So naturally, people who are, let's say, magicians, or even for that matter, charlatans, are also um the type of the type of characters you find in in that world mm-hmm. okay that, that's that's interesting I just wanted to get some perspective on how this is viewed for how anyone may be taking um, all of this in you had mentioned in in your letters to me about some of the the cases here um, about a woman uh, classified as as a witch 
who sold her soul by mistake to hurt someone that she was jealous of. Now, when you say a witch, can you define what that is and and go into that case and, and tell us a little bit more about what was discovered there? Okay, so this is the case that we're talking about. It is the, the case we're talking about, okay. Uh, yes, yeah, this is the large one that uh, I've just written a book about. Um, okay. It will it will probably be released later this year, so keep a look out for that one. Uh, but what it does is that it uh, documents part of the story. I've uh, completely fictionalized it in respect for the people, of course. Mm-hmm. But uh, but the story is actually quite an interesting one. This, wasn't a, a, this woman wasn't a witch at all, actually. What had happened to her was that she had become an abandoned part of her own family due to uh, due to certain circumstances that had unfolded between them. And uh, as she went out into the world alone, unable to fend for herself and so on, she felt completely abandoned by her God and by her faith and so on. And in that very, very vulnerable state, she one day meets a rather strange man at the local supermarket. Um, he obviously has a sexual interest in her and invites her along. But uh, and as the relationship progresses, she realizes that he's actually uh, someone who uh, who operates a local, uh, a, a sort of like a local a local temple for one of the other religions. You know, the smaller s- sectorial religions that um, are, that are here from the many mixed communities in South Africa, because we have a lot of immigrants from many parts of the world. Mm-hmm. So um, in, uh, he obviously was a priest by day, and his job at night was to help people to, uh, well, do the things that they really want uh, that they really want done, but can't usually get done. And this includes things like uh, if you have a specific vendetta against someone to maybe hurt them in that process, or if uh, you feel that you need to be able to effect control over someone, then he he had the type of uh, skills and magical spells in order to do so. So in his company, living with him for many years, she, like me, had become his apprentice. Okay, mm-hmm. so uh, she learned the craft from him. Obviously, without a proper context and background education into how it actually worked. So over a period of time, she uh, learned some spells which allowed her to um, attract a demon of her own so that she could command it uh, to do her own bidding. And uh, the spell that actually uh, does this is quite a strange one, to be quite honest. What they do is that they uh, they, have a, they have a specific room which is completely dark. It's cold, dark, it's concrete, there's nothing really in there. But uh, they draw a circle on the floor with certain specific symbols that relate to uh, different, uh, uh, different uh, natural elements like fire, water, air, and so on. Um, But uh, she sits in the center of the circle and waits. That's really how they attract the devil. But in order to attract the devil, what they do is they mimic the demon's behavior, the genies. So uh, part of one of the things that they do is that they, for instance, eat their own feces because the genies eat feces or they feed off human excrement, waste, and so on. So uh, she did this for a period of time, and eventually the devil who had possessed this, um, the, the woman we were trying to exercise, um, she attracted that particular jinni, and they struck a deal between themselves. At that point in time, she was so hell-bent on getting back, to her, uh, getting back at her family for, uh, for abandoning her that she had neglected to really look at what kind of bargain she was striking with this demon. And in the process of having her own uh, vengeance affected, she had sold her own soul to the devil, which meant that when he was done finishing the work, he, her, you could say her body and soul then belonged to him, so he could enter and come out as, as frequently as he liked and take over her. In that way, living vicariously in our physical world, uh, through her. So she was able to seek her vengeance successfully in exchange for then her being taken over once she achieved that goal. What was she able in this case to seek her vengeance? And then it proceeded into the taking over of her body and soul. Um, well, indeed, it certainly worked for a while because we were sitting with um, the woman who was possessed in front of us. So 
for a period of, well, at least about a year or so before uh, before they had come to seek help at the, um, at, at the magician, um, her life was completely derailed. She had uh, lost a job, she had lost, um, she had lost a lot of contact with her family, things were going horribly wrong for her. I mean, it was really a lot of her own doing and she had, in a way, she had been ostracizing herself from her own family and that was the punishment that uh, the old lady, the witch, actually wanted. She felt that because she was abandoned by her family, she wanted to take someone that they loved dearly and make that person throw the same family away. Uh, the irony of the situation was that uh, obviously um, if she felt that she had, if the witch that felt that she had been um, completely abandoned by her society, eventually she had led herself into such a situation that uh, she herself had no, uh, had driven herself into a, a place of isolation where she was the possession of the of the Ginny that she enlisted for the duty in the first place. That wraps up part one of our interview with Yusef Tilly about dark magic in part two of our interview, available exclusively for Gravekeepers at patreon.com slash the Grave Talks. We'll discuss is there ever a way to rescue or reverse the choice of selling one soul? After experiencing so many of these cases, does Yusef believe in the power of this magic? How did a demon take over the actions of a priest? and simply pretend to help those in need. Are jinns and ghosts the same thing? And how do good jinns and bad jinns interact with one another? Those questions and more in part two of our interview with Yusef Tilly. To hear it, become a gravekeeper, sign up on our website at thegravetalks.com or patreon.com slash thegravetalks. Until next time for The Grave Talks, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening.